Hello, my name is Simon Wardley, and I'm the inventor of Wardley Mapping. In this session, I'd like to talk to you about anticipation. Now, to do this, we're going to use a number of patterns known as climactic patterns. These are patterns which you don't really have a choice over. They are caused by supply and demand competition. But if you know those patterns, you can apply them to a map to anticipate what is going to change. To demonstrate this, we're going to start with a map. This is a map of compute in 2006. Starting from the point of view of a user needing an application, that application is built with best coding practice on a runtime. A runtime is a coding environment like .NET or LAMP. That is built on an operating system, and that is built on best architectural practice for compute as a product. So back in 2006, those architectural practices included things like M plus one, disaster recovery tests, capacity planning. Now in 2006, compute evolved from a product to more of a utility with the introduction of AWS's EC2. Now obviously that project started many years beforehand. It was actually Benjamin Black who proposed it and it was built by Chris Pingham and others in South Africa as a standalone service, by the way. Now, the general pattern that you learn is that everything evolves. If there is supply and demand competition, stuff will shift from the left to the right. And one of the effects that has is inertia. You see, we have inertia to this change because of pre-existing practices and pre-existing capital. If compute shifts from a product to a utility and I've got data centers full of servers, now obviously I'm going to have some resistance to that change. Another impact that happens is co-evolution. So as compute shifted from a product to a utility, its characteristics change. And that causes a co-evolution of practice. For example, in computers as a product, we had what's called high MTTR, high mean time to recovery, i.e. it would take you weeks, if not months, to get a new machine, which is why we did all this capacity planning, why we made machines extra resilient with all this M plus one and redundant components, why we did all these disaster recovery tests. But as compute shifted to a utility, it now has low MTTR, i.e. if I want a machine, it takes me seconds to get a new one. It's an API call. As a result, we get new architectural practices. We distribute systems. We design for failure. We do things like chaos engines or chaos monkey, as Netflix call, called it. And that's the introduction of random failure into a system to ensure it's resilient and you can do this because you can just spin up new machines whenever you need them, and you're not having to wait weeks or months for new machines to appear. Another pattern that appears is as things evolve, not only do you get new practices, but they make it easier to build higher order systems. Now those higher order systems are in a space we call the adjacent unexplored. I, we don't know what they are, we don't know which ones are going to have value. You could have kit and internet, or you could have video streaming. We don't really know which one's going to be successful. But we do know that in that space, new areas of value will be created. Now, those are powerful forces. Because what you're mixing is efficiency with speed through new practices, through new sources of value, due to the new things being built. And if I'm competing against others, and I've got efficiency, speed, and new sources of value, I obviously create pressure on everybody else to adapt. And the more people that adapt to this world, the more the pressure mounts. And that's known as the Red Queen effect, which is why you have no choice over evolution. Something like cloud was never a question of if, only a question of when. Now, this map is basically the same as 
uh, the one I created in 2008 when I was running strategy for a company called Canonical. And we used the map to anticipate how the market was changing and where we needed to invest. So we knew cloud was the future. We wouldn't have a choice. We knew the emerging practices would start to dominate. We didn't know it was going to be called DevOps. We knew there were going to be new needs uh, created, new things, new sources of value. So we need to focus on companies building in that area. We also knew where not to invest. So pre-existing data centers, computers a product, architectural practices around that space, we needed to move away from. Now this was 2008. The company was canonical, and what we provided was an operating system known as Ubuntu. And we were two to 3% of the operating system market against two giants. Red Hat and Microsoft. It took 18 months. It cost half a million pounds. And we went from 2 to 3% of the market to 70% of all cloud computing. And of course, evolution doesn't stop there. Emerging practices continue to evolve. Eventually, it got a name. Two friends of mine, Andy and Patrick, called it DevOps. The old best architectural practice got a new name as well. It was called Legacy. 2014, uh, the runtime shifted uh, from a product to more a utility space with the introduction of services like AWS Lambda. And that's the whole serverless area. And of course, what that created, same as with compute, was new practices, which we now have a name for, we call them FinOps, as well as uh, new needs, new sources of value. Again, it's those three forces of efficiency, speed, new value. You have no choice over this space. It's not a question of if you're going serverless. It's only a question of when. The other thing that also points out is the strategy we had in 2008, 2010 was great for then, but a decade later, it's the wrong place to focus. You need to focus on serverless, FinOps, and those new needs. What we focused on in 2008 to 2010, now that space is heading towards the new legacy. And that points to another pattern, which is strategy is iterative. What worked 10 years ago does not necessarily work today. If you want to learn more about this space, there's a book called The Flywheel Effect, which describes the journey of a 100-year-old insurance company onto services like Lambda and the use of serverless. So I suppose in, in conclusion, I just want to leave um, with this message. There are many, many different types of patterns that you learn from mapping. The climactic patterns, though they're not things that you can change, they are useful for anticipation of where the market is going. Thank you.